I go to prepare a place, he said. If I go, I'll come again to receive you to myself. That's good. I've never heard that song before. But I'm sure there's a lot of them I've never heard before. And that was a good one. Turn to Gospel Matthew chapter number 6 this morning with me, please. Matthew chapter number 6, verse number 5. Matthew chapter number 6, Levi, the publican. Chapter number 6, verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Amen. After this manner therefore pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <laughs> thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debtors as we forgive and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, bless this holy book now. Let me do what you've called me to do. Be glorified this morning, Father. I'm nothing but a messenger. Happy to be that. In thy name I pray. Amen. I've heard an awful lot of preachers get up and malign Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 8 and simply say that's a model prayer. In other words, don't worry about praying well, that's all right. If that's what you want to do, that's fine between you and God. But I pray that prayer probably every day of my life. And I started praying that prayer some time back. I haven't always done that. I've always known it and learned it in high school. I learned it in the public school system, by the way. Amen. Didn't destroy us and by doing that, you know. But I, I've prayed it on and off down through the years since I got saved. But it seems like here in the last few years that it just has become part of my life that I pray that prayer every day. Let me tell you something this morning, dear friend. Forget whether it's called a model prayer or not. Do you find anything wrong with it? <laughs> just think about the fact that you're reading something here the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you want to pray, pray after this manner. And then He said it forth for you. And when He did... It had power in it, because when you pray this prayer, it does something for you, me anyway. Well, the other morning, I was out in the back porch, and I was praying. And as usual, I started praying the Lord's Prayer. I got about halfway through it, the Lord said, I don't you preach that. <laughs> I, said, all right. I said, all right, Lord, you want me to preach it? Yes, sir. He said, I want you to preach it. I said, all right, Lord, if that's what you want, I'll preach. Yep. Matthew chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Now I'm going to call your attention to a few things in this prayer that I think are the elements that are involved in any prayer. This is why they call it a model prayer. That's all right in that sense that the things that you find in this prayer in Matthew chapter number 6, you could, it could be the basis of any prayer that you pray. It doesn't have to be word for word for what you read here. But let me say again, ain't a thing wrong with praying a prayer and quoting these words verbatim. I do it practically every day of my life, 
And when I meditate on what I'm praying and I think about it, there's power in those words. There's power in them. There really is. Now, of course, if you're in this house this morning, the devil's got you stopped praying. Somewhere along the line, you quit praying and gave up on calling upon God. Then uh, what's it done for your spiritual life, dear friend? Where are you this morning? Are you going forward with God or are you going backward? And I'm here to help you. I'm not here to put you down. I'm not here to run you, you know, run you through and, and make uh, cannon fodder out of you. I get no joy out of that, but I'm here to help you. And spiritual things cannot be substituted. And prayer is one of those basic spiritual things in your life. Now, the Lord said here in Matthew, He said, when you pray, you can get in your closet and shut the door. And when you get in there and shut the door, talk to your Heavenly Father in secret where nobody can hear you, and then your Heavenly Father will answer you in public where everybody can see it. So there's something about this that just absolutely speaks to the human soul. And folks, I want to be spoken to, don't you? Don't you get tired of superficial fluff? Don't you get tired of religious, uh, religious, uh, uh, just, uh, just a warmed over religious cliches that had no power or meaning? And so the Lord said here in Matthew, when you pray, pray thusly, our Father. And my friend, I say to you, our Father, what a thing. You know what he said in the book of Romans? Chapter number 8, he said, we say, Abba, Father. We have the most dearest term to say, our Father. Now, if you're one of these that go around day in and day out and you're, and you're cursing God and, and you're calling upon God to damn this or damn that, let me tell you why you're doing that, all right? Just listen to me for a moment. You're doing it because you're damned. If you go around and spend your days and you feel a blessing and you're blessing things and virtue is coming out of you, it's because virtue has been put into you. Amen. It's that simple, folks. When you spend all your time talking about a curse, it's because you're cursed. So how can I remove that curse? You can't remove that curse, but He can. Hallelujah. That's the whole point, and that is the key to the mystery of salvation. God can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And religion can't do it. It'll fail you miserably. The arm of your flesh cannot do it. You'll fail miserably. Your intellect cannot do it. It'll fail you miserably. Your education can't do it. Your associates, your church, your preacher, your religion, it'll all fail you. But the arm of the Lord will uphold you, and with a great and mighty arm, He took them out of Egypt 400 years in captivity, and He executed judgment upon all the gods of the Egyptians. There was a battle raging that the human eye could not see. When God called them out of Egypt, He stood up eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe, to every god in Egypt, and said, Come on, boys, it's time for battle. They didn't come, they ran. When the Almighty stands and thunders forth and roars and said, There is no other God beside me. I know none. And there isn't, folks. There is not our Father. So do you call Him Father? Do you call Him Father because somebody told you to call Him Father? That's not worth a dime. But if you call Him Father because He is your Father, that tells you what's going on inside your soul. And I call Him Father because He's my Father. Say, when did he become your father? I thought God's the father of all. No, he's only the father of those that he begets. That are his children. So what's that, preacher? That's the new birth. That's to be born of God. John chapter number 3, Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. And so my father, our father, which art in heaven. Heaven is the abode of God for man, for his creation, not for God. God abided forever in His place. There is nothing but God from everlasting to everlasting. But He has a heaven. He had this dear sister just sang about. Did you hear what she said? She was talking about this land that is fairer than day. By faith we shall see it afar. Over there in Psalm chapter number 73, Asaph. Asaph said, I was, he said, I was weary. He said, I was bothered by the, by, by the, by the prosperity of the wicked. He said, it began to eat at my soul because I saw how the wicked lived. They prospered until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then he said, I saw their end. And from that day on, he no longer fancied the wicked. He no longer thought how great it was to live like they lived. 
from that day on he pitied them because he knew what was waiting for them. It is waiting for you. Somewhere out there there's a door that you've got to go through that is the end of your life. You're going to have to go through it. What's on the other side? Tell me, my dear friend. You, this, this, you some, some of you may be smart, Alex, and say, I die like there's nothing. I die like a dog. There's nothing out there. Oh, you really know that, do you? What do you base that on? You ever been over there and come back to tell us about it? You don't know what's over there, but I know what the Bible says. I know what happened in the book of Luke 16 when the rich man died and was buried. There's his body. Then in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Don't you think that to be a horrible thing when the day comes that all of your lies, all of your deception, all of your trickery, all of your deceit, all of your foolishness, all of your science, all of your gods, all of that stuff fails you? And you come to your senses in a lake of fire? Asaph said, until I saw their end. One man said it this way, he said, preacher, where's hell? And the other preacher answered him and said, Hell, where is it? Where is it? It is at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, blessed be that name. Does that name excite you? Was that the name you cried out when you read the Scripture or somebody prayed with you? Well, you got on your knees and you said, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Jesus. I need to be saved. I'm lost without God. Jesus, come into my heart and into my soul. And he did. And from that day on, Jesus became the sweetest name you knew. You wanted to talk about him. You wanted to sing about him. You wanted to read about him. You wanted to talk to him. He was precious to you. And every time you ever heard his name, black guarded or run down or cursed or something like that, it upsets you because He is your Lord and your Savior. The thing that makes a Christian a Christian is Christ. And without Him, it's just a word. Jesus. Call Him Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sins. The Greek word Jesus is translated into English Jesus. And Jesus in English is the Old Testament Jehovah. And that is the covenant keeping God, which means God saves. Jehovah saves, the Savior, the Savior, the Salvation One, and He is the Savior. And friend, if you've ever been saved, you'll say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I had no desire in mine, I had no desire in my soul to take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in vain. I have no desire to reside, hallelujah, to God. I got nothing inside me that wants to curse His name. I want to bless it because He's blessed me. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Bible said God will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. But taketh his name in vain. What happens in your life if some tragedy comes or something happens that you can't control? That's life. That's the earth. That's what we're living in. This is all the hell you'll ever know. Aren't you glad for that? You're looking at it right now. And this is the only heaven the unsaved will ever know. Their heaven's a hell here and it'll be worse there. But what happens to you when something goes awry? Do you begin to cry in the name of Jesus and take it in vain and stomp it under your feet and make fun of Him and say, well, if this is what it is to be a Christian, I will no part of it. Let me tell you what it is to be a Christian. It's not what you do. It's who you know. Once you know Him, you will always know Him. He'll be within you a well of water of life, springing up into everlasting life. He'll be the Spirit of the living God, permeating your soul, animating your life, and giving you life from within. It comes from the within. Friend, if you've ever been born of the Spirit of God, there's something greater in you than is in this world. You don't need their outside stimulus. Have you ever noticed how the unsaved turn the lights up and the music is so loud you can't even hear yourself think? And they get in there and they begin to move and shake their flesh. Do you know why? They've got to be excited. Why? Now listen carefully what I'm going to tell you. 
morning I was listening to a Lutheran preacher. I think he's up some Wisconsin, somewhere up north. Now, before you jump up and down and say, what in the world is this Baptist preacher doing listening to a Lutheran preacher? You'd be amazed sometime, my dear friend, that God speaks to more than just Baptists. He was talking about our son. Not only our son, but all of the stars out there. He said there's a big ball of gas. Just a huge burning inferno. I can understand that. He says that the core of that burning inferno is a nuclear reaction constantly taking place. And that literally, that it is burning up the fuel that is inside. So you see this huge, brilliant light. It's just a big furnace up there in the sky. Makes sense? But he said the time will come when that star will eventually burn its fuel out. Because there's nothing left to burn. And when that moment comes, the star begins to collapse on itself. But before it does, he said that according to what he reads from the physicists and what they have to say, that it has one last flash. And it's called a supernova. One last brilliant fire into the, into the sky. And then it collapses on itself. But as it collapses on itself, a, something begins to happen that's just mind-boggling. What at one time produced light has now literally become a black spot. Literally a black hole. And this thing, because of the nature of gravity and the nature of physics and all of that that relate to it, I'm certainly no physicist. I sound like a fool if I try to get into that. But the bottom line is this, that by collapsing on itself, there is so much power involved in this, in this, in this moment that it begins to suck into itself everything around, even to the point of light cannot even get out. Light. And it becomes a black hole sucking everything into its midst. And then that Lutheran preacher looked right into the camera and he said, My dear friend, if you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and in your soul, you have a soul that is like a black hole. You're completely dead to God. I thought, Amen, son. Amen. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in you, my dear friend, these are just words that fly across your head. Because without Him, you're just as dead as you could possibly be. You're dead to everything of God. You're dead to everything spiritual. You're dead to everything that is of life and light and holiness and goodness and the grace of God. You're like a black hole, just as empty and dead as you can be. And I thought, brother, you used a good illustration. You don't care if I use it, do you? Of course, he couldn't hear me. See, we're preachers are like that. We hear one say something like that that's real good. We think, we think now, if the Lord let him use it, why can't I use it? So I used it on you this morning. And I remind you once again, if you won't use another man's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own. Amen. How many of you sitting in this house today just as dead as you can be to what I'm talking about? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Isn't that wonderful? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Isn't that marvelous? Let's look at the Bible. Matthew chapter number 6. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. You're constantly praying for something and someone to come down here because it's not getting any better. Yesterday I was on the internet doing a little research and I came upon a website that had a photograph of this book that was prominently displayed and it said, The Gay Christian. How many has ever seen that book? Prominently displayed, The Gay Christian. But here's the kicker. It was not in a secular bookstore. It was in a Christian bookstore. Are you following me now? When you walk into a Christian bookstore, you expect 
to get Christian books that stopped a long time ago. You're liable to see anything from Khalil Gibran to uh, Young, what's his first name, Young, J-U-N-G. You're liable, to see, uh, you're liable to see Aleister Crowley. You're liable to see anything. They're talking about all this stuff that people are doing today. And I'm going to tell you, please hear me, please hear me, please hear what I'm saying. It's not coming. You're going through it right now. You're in the midst of a horrible apostasy. A terrible apostasy. The apostasy is thick and deep. And my friend, if you embrace sodomy, you have the spirit of the Antichrist right now. <clears throat> you ought to look and you ought to say to yourself, Hallelujah, God. I'm already seeing the spirit of Antichrist permeating everything in religion. What's left, preacher? The man. The Antichrist. He's alive right now. If you believe he could show up at any moment, you believe he's alive. Sodomy, transgenderism, and all the rest of it is associated with the goddess, queen of heaven. I beg you in the name of Jesus, get my Sunday school tapes for the last three Sundays and just listen to them. And you will be amazed at the ground I'm, I've covered. And I'm not finished. I'm not finished. It is an amazing thing at how this goddess worship, this feminine goddess, has just literally taken over everything. And this business of effeminate men. Men should not be effeminate. Man should be a man and a woman should be a woman. The gender line should be very clear. I wish the day would come back when we respected and honored our women. I wish the day would come back when chastity was in vogue again. I wish the day would come back when you could see the girls and say to yourself, that old boy got him a good one. He doesn't deserve her. I'm telling you, the day was, but it's not now. Because you go to the courthouse now, and these girls can accuse some guy of raping her. Sexual molestation. Let me tell you something, girls. You've got a hard road in front of you. You know why? Because most of the girls out there running around have been jumping from one bed to the next. And the court knows it. And just because you got mad at your boyfriend or somebody like that and you think you're going to just put him down and destroy him. Oh, no, 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 no. You can thank feminism. You can thank the feminist movement. You can thank that crowd that destroyed chastity and decency and purity among our women. Man, do you understand that once the devil came into your home, and took your wives and your daughters and turned them into something that you wouldn't even go out and fight for. That they have destroyed the fabric and the foundation of America. There was a time when a man would gladly take up a weapon and go to the battlefield to fight for his wife and his daughters and to fight for their honor. Now you live in a society where they showcase promiscuity. And you never hear that word. You heard it from me, but I guarantee you, you can watch television for a year and never hear the word promiscuous. Promiscuity. And the reason is because the very foundations of our society have been torn asunder. Oh, it's good. It's a good thing to be the virgin daughter of Zion. Oh, isn't it a good thing? Oh, yes it is, men. When you have the virgin daughter of Zion, the man becomes a man. He becomes what a man ought to be. But the problem is, men are no longer men. They won't fight for anything, and they still won't even take care of their children. They won't even pay child support. Why? Because they say, well, good night. Before DNA showed up, they'd come along and say, whose child is it? The only way you can prove now that who the child belongs to is through DNA. Amen. Isn't that sad? Yes. Yes. We lost that. Amen. 
Lost it. Somewhere down the pack. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our weekly bread. I messed up, didn't I? I'm glad you caught me. What's it say? Our daily bread. Amen. The manna came every day. What's that mean, preacher? It means God wants you to count on Him to feed you every day. Amen. Well, the government will take care of me. Oh, my goodness gracious. You're crippled too high for crutches. <laughs> you think the government's going to take care of you, do you? <laughs> Let me tell you what the government's good at. Taking your money, not giving it to you. <laughs> the government's going to take care of me. Oh, boy. <laughs> No, I'm going to tell you who will take care of you. The Lord will take care of you. The Lord will take care of you. He'll take care of you. Now watch verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh, boy. Say, preacher, I wish that wasn't in there. I know a lot of people do. You just don't know what so-and-so said about me or did to me. I understand. I understand all about it. I know human nature. been acquainted with it now for a few decades. Well, preacher, I'll tell you what. I'm going to live for God, but that's one thing I can't do. Well, you're really not going to live for God. Because you're going to have something like an albatross around your neck. It's going to haunt you. It's going to follow you. It's going to beat you to death. You've got to be able to forgive. Notice he didn't say forget. He just said forgive. Forgetting's another issue. Amen. If you've got a brain like mine, you can forget. Amen. <laughs> God's blessed me with a terrible memory. Hallelujah to God. Can't remember anything. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> but forgive is a choice you make. Hey Amen. You'll know you're growing in grace in the Lord when you can walk up and take hold of a man or a woman's hand and shake hands with them and look them eyeball to eyeball and tell them you love them in the Lord and you can fellowship with them and you can praise God and you know they treated you like a dog, but you can still do it. And maybe the way you react to them after they know they've treated you like a dog is a witness and a testimony to them where they might see something real for the first time in your life in their lives. The Lord Jesus Christ said you heap coals of fire on their heads. That's what he said. But you don't do it to heap coals of fire on your head. If you're doing it for that, you've got the wrong motive. Do it because you mean it. There's nothing in the world more powerful on the face of this earth than a bunch of people who can't get along with each other, a bunch of people who get to the point they despise each other. I heard one time about a church that finally busted up. It had been busted up a long time. They just came to the church, came to the same house. But finally it came to a head, and one day they were literally shouting and screaming at each other and had a dog fight right down there in the altar, and then they went out the door. So I mean, what a good service. Wasn't that a wonderful place to be? I thought to myself, I wonder what if somebody came in off the street and saw that. What kind of a testimony is that? You see, some of you are going here, you're going there, you're hunting here, you're hunting there. Well, I'm going to find a bunch of people that are like me. You'll never find them. I'm going to find me a perfect church. Quit looking. I'm going to go over here because these people are different. No, they're not. They're just like all the rest of them. People are people. They just act differently. They just have a different idea of what religion's about. But the bottom line is, you can have a powerful church right here if you learn how to live together and forgive each other and then bear one another's burdens. That's what he said. The Lord did. He said, forgive us our debts. And then in verse number 13, he said, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, that's a strong term. And an awful lot of theologians get all messed up with this because they say, now hold on a minute, preacher. Now wait just a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You don't say God leads somebody into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. What does 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 say? It says, because they love not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. For this cause, God shall give them a strong delusion that they may believe a lie. If you want the truth, dear friend, God will compass land and sea to get it to you. That's His nature. If you'll open the Bible with an open mind and an open heart 
and said, Lord God, I've got a lot of reservations about this. There's some things I don't understand. I've got a lot of big questions. There's just some stuff going on in here, and it's been going on in church, and the way people have treated me. don't understand. But I'll tell you what, Lord, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to come to you with an honest heart. Show me in my heart where I'm wrong in the Bible and speak to me in my soul and I'll listen to you. Because you are greater than I am. I'll listen. If you'll come to God with that attitude, He'll open up the book for you. And He'll speak to you. And you'll find out He's real. You will. You'll find out He's real and you'll find out He communicate with you. But you'll have to give up that when you're hiding behind. You'll have to quit making excuses. You'll just have to come face to face with the Almighty. Amen. If you'll come with an honest heart, He'll answer it. Amen. But if you come before God, preconceived notions and ideas, full of spite and hatred and bitterness, and look to the Scripture to find support for what you don't believe, and look through the Bible to find mistakes in the Bible, look through the Bible to find contradictions in the Scripture, let me tell you where it'll lead you. It'll lead you into more bitterness. More contradiction, yes, more the same, right. and more condemnation. Amen. The entrance of thy words give us light. Amen. It give us understanding to the simple. Amen. But the problem is, I stand at the door and knock. Amen. He Amen. won't force himself into Amen. your house. Amen. That's probably, of all the things that God ever gave a human being, is the most precious. What's that? Your volition. He won't violate your will. You have to consciously choose to accept Him, let Him in, let Him speak to you, receive the truth, or consciously reject it. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. The word condemnation in John that word means this. This is the basis that God will judge you by. That's what that word means. That's a powerful statement, folks. This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Amen. And then finally, bless his righteous name. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. How many's ever heard of, I don't know, you know, a lot of people aren't like me. How many's ever sat through a synagogue and a service when the Jews come together? I watch everything under the sun. I watched a guru the other day. I watched these people, they're sitting, they were sitting in a, they were sitting under a tent or some kind of a building. Now listen to me. These people were sitting there just like this. And I sat there and watched that for about 15 minutes, and nobody moved. I thought, what's going on here? And then this car drove up. This guy got out of the car. He walked into the building, and the moment he walked into the building, every eye was up on him. He walked right into the midst of the crowd, and they all got nigger him. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to touch him. And he would go around and put his hand on top of their head. He put his hand on this one's head. Put his hand on that one's head. Pull in this hand, this hand. Then after he did that, he went up and sat down on the stage. And he sat down in a chair. He sat there and he looked around. And here they came. One woman came up there and she fell down on her knees. And she crawled up to him and she took his hand. And she began to pour out her soul, all of her problems, to this man sitting in this chair. You know what he was? He was a Hindu guru. That's what he was. Do you think those, do you think those people were free? No. First place, he's nothing but flesh and blood. He's just a man. He can't make one change in their lives. Just a man. Like me, just a man. Well, you know, I've watched stuff that literally blew my mind. I watched a man cast a demon out of a girl. And as he was casting that demon out of that girl, 
he started talking to that demon. And he said to that demon, what's your legal ground? So what are you talking about? That demon had a legal ground that it had bound itself to. In other words, don't give place to the devil. She'd given him a place. That demon had latched on to it. Why that, preacher? Why is that even possible? You want me to explain it to you? The kingdoms of this world right now are under the control of the God of this world. He has authority in this world. Believe me, He does. His demons have authority. And when they come into a person's life, it's because you opened the door to let them in. The Lord said, I stand at the door and knock. You opened the door and they came in. You can do it with a Ouija board. You can do it with Charlie Charlie. You can do it with, with the sins of the flesh. You can do it through a, a drugs, a lot music, a lot of things. Wrong doctrine. And they come in. And once they come in, they don't give up their territory easily. There's got to be one stronger than them to get them out. And here's the key, here's the key to it. Here's the key. Your will, your will, are you willing to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse you, purge you. You don't have to confess to a person in this building what you've done this past week. You confess it to God. Don't tell a man what you've done. He'll use it on you later. You confess it to God alone. He'll never use it on you. It's cleansed and it's gone. So I watched him. Man, a battle ensued. And then finally this man who, they call him an exorcist, said in the name of Jesus Christ, you have no more authority over this girl. You come out of her right now. In his name I plead the blood covenant against you. Come out of her. And you know what happened? A howling, screeching, grinding, moaning. And then she fell back as if she had been released or something had released itself from her. And she appeared to have peace. I don't know what happened later. I don't know how far it went. Like I say to you, I am not an exorcist, but I use that to make a point. Satan has authority. If you give him place in your life, he will take authority in your life. And the only one that can get him out of your life is the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've got a door you can open and you have a will that's yours. And that will is a sovereign, precious thing. Do you have it? Who have you given your life to today? Who? What, what have you done with your will? Have you chosen Him? Have you, are you living for Him? That's my prayer and my question. Have you done that? This may be the last time you ever see my face. I may leave this world today. I'm not... I don't go around with a morbid thought about I'm going to die at any moment. I don't have some morbid thought, you know, to just go kill myself. But I've been here too long not to understand that at any minute would be my last minute on planet Earth. And I know whom I have believed. I know Him. Do you know Him? Father, in thy name we pray. In Jesus' name, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Stand up this morning.